go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Trisha Perez Keneally. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you back to the Inn at Hastings Park. As you can see, um, if Christine pans the room, Christmas, the holidays have arrived here at the Inn at Hastings Park. So it's time. I hope that everyone enjoyed a very happy, small, safe, flavorful Thanksgiving. Um, so now I'm here to talk a little bit about some recipes that you might be able to use whether you're celebrating Hanukkah, Christmas, New Year's, Kwanzaa, whatever, um, whatever particular holiday um, is meaningful to you um, at this very special time of the year. So I think I, some of you may follow me on Instagram. My handle is Trisha Perez Keneally. What I talked about last week is that I do not have a big family of turkey eaters. Um, we tend to like a lot of beef in our house. And so my Thanksgiving meal centered around a standing rib roast which some people find a little bit intimidating. It's a pretty cumbersome piece of meat. It's basically a ribeye steak in roast form. Um, but it's all about knowing your product and knowing what you want to do with it. So behind me, I actually have three examples of different types of roast that you might be able to use to make a holiday meal. This is a, this is basically the meat part of a standing rib roast. So this is, if you like ribeye steak, this is basically a series of ribeye steaks. And what they've done is they've taken it off the bone. This is a very um, straightforward roast to make that you would do on high temperature. The reason I'm going to focus on the tenderloin today, but I wanted you to get an understanding of the different cuts of meat, um, what they look like, the expense of them and what you would do to cook them. So standing rib roast, you see that it has this thin layer of fat. Um, it had a fat cap, right, that the butcher basically removed. And the fat cap can be about this thick. This was actually the fat that I cut off um, the eye of the round cut that I had that's already in the oven. So with a standing rib roast, you can see there's marbling. And when people talk about marbling, what they're talking about is the fat that's running through it. The beauty of a rib roast is you see that line of fat that's basically running, it basically is running through the entire length of the roast. That actually is kind of like natural basting because as you're cooking, that fat is sort of melting away and helping the meat stay juicy. A rib roast, I like my meat on the rare side, but a, a rib roast is something that you probably want to have at medium rare, because if it's a little bit a touch under that, you're still going to, the fat isn't going to dissolve exactly the way that you would want it to. What I would do when preparing this roast is I probably would let it sit uncovered in the refrigerator overnight because it kind of helps dry out the meat a little bit and it'll give you some of that nice crustiness that people like that, that beautiful out, that exterior that has sort of that caramelization with whatever seasoning you might be using. What I usually do is I usually make a little bit of a paste. Um, I have a paste here that I made. Um, this is the recipe that I included with the tenderloin. This is chopped rosemary. There's thyme, there's olive oil. Um, and there's adobo. And usually like what I did, like you saw that there were three tablespoons of adobo, you know, one tablespoon, I'm sorry, three tablespoons of um, adobo and then a tablespoon of the other ones. Use that as your base. If you're making a very large roast, you probably want to double the recipe. So what I always talk about, it's three parts, which means there's three tablespoon, three tablespoons, and then there's one part, which is the one tablespoon. So I would just use that as a rule of thumb. Some people like to use butter. Um, I, I tend to use olive oil when I'm doing this because th the recipes that I like to use are high temperature. And butter at that very high temperature is also, it's gonna, it's gonna burn a little bit. But if you like the fl flavor of butter, you're also more than welcome to make the, the paste or that, that additional fat with a little bit of the, um, with the butter. If I'm doing a standing rib roast, I do a dry rub. I wouldn't be adding the oil. This fat is more than enough. And the standing rib roast that I made last week, I basically covered it in coarse kosher salt and like freshly ground pepper. And I just covered the entire, um, the entire roast with it. So that is the, the rib roast. A rib roast um, without 
the ribs. This is about, this was $9.99 a pound at Costco. And I do buy, you know, I like to support local farms, but I do also buy meat at Costco. I actually find it to be very high quality, but there are also some very fantastic butchers in the area, McKinnon's, Wilson's always has, you know, a good selection of meats. Um, what's a little bit more challenging is that they don't cut to order. You can order meat ahead, but sometimes I'm very specific that I want, like, for example, on Thanksgiving, I wanted three ribs. I wanted a three rib roast. And that was enough to feed 10 people because that's another question that I always get. How do I know what to buy? If you want to have leftovers and you're having 10 people, which is what you know we're being asked to do this holiday season, three or four ribs is probably enough. A large rib roast, right, which has like, you know, the, it'll have, I can't remember if it's seven or eight ribs. So it's basically like having the equivalent of 16 ribeye steaks, because you're basically, you have the one that has the rib in it, then there's like an inch between the ribs. So it's basically like serving up 16 ribeye steaks. That's a lot of meat. So if you were having 20, 25 people, that would be more in the order, but you probably with a three, a three rib roast, you probably would be good to go. So the other cut that the other two cuts that I have here, this is tenderloin. And this is like the holy grail for some people. Like this is your Chateaubriand. This little part right here will turn into the, the filet, filet mignon. And this is what I cut the center part to roast, but it's pretty long. And there's no bone in here. There's very little fat in here. So there's very little shrinkage. So with five to six ounces of tenderloin per person, that is an extremely generous serving. The other thing is that this is probably one of the most expensive pieces of meat that you're going to buy, especially the way that I bought it. I bought it trimmed, which means that all the silver, like the silver membrane, the chain was taken off. So they've done all of that. That's value added work. So they paid somebody to do that. And that's why you're going to get that price. This was the 1999 a pound. There also is prime, which is a higher grade, which would probably run you, depending on where you buy it, anywhere between $27 and $32 a pound. When you are paying that kind of money for a piece of meat, you do want to make sure that you know how to cook it. So there's very little fat in a tenderloin. So that's why the having the mixture with some fat in it helps to sort of maintain some of the moisture. This is actually one of the most straightforward things that you could make for an elegant and easy holiday or festive meal. So basically what I did, and if you come over here, we can take a peek. The one on the left, is the tenderloin. And what I did is I basically, I completely massaged it and had it covered in the olive oil and that combination of rosemary, adobo, there's a little bit of garlic powder and thyme in there. If you wanted to use a different, you could use salt and pepper and make a little bit of a paste with olive oil and salt and pepper. If you wanted to use, these are some of the herbs that are in herbs that provolves. I think I had a bag right here. Oh, this was oregano. So herbs of Provence, you can, you know, that's the traditional French, you know, it has oregano, marjoram, it has a common thyme in it, rosemary, it adds a very Mediterranean flavor to, um, to the beef, but it's, it's one of those classic combinations. So standing alongside it is right here is Eye of the Round. This is a much less expensive cut of meat, and you can even tell like, look at the difference in color. Look at the deep, the, the, the deep redness of that loin. And then you have the eye of the round. What I would do to prepare it is I would take off this fat cap. And as you can see, I already have done some, my cutting board was there. It comes off super, super easy. I'm using a very, very sharp knife and I'm taking off that fat. And again, it's the trimming of the meat. It's taking meat off the bone, taking off the membrane, taking off, you know, the chain in the meat. These are the things that make, you know, they add, you know, it's butchering. So it adds an expense to it. And then what I would do with both of these is I would lather them with that mixture. I use Eye of the Round. I, it's, an, it's a much less expensive cut of meat. This, I think, was about 4 or $5 a pound. 
I use it, like if I'm doing, for example, a buffet and we're having an open house for 40 or 50 people, I like to cook off a few eye of the rounds. I cut them thinly and I use them to make a beautiful steak sandwich. It's also like, it's flavorful enough that it stands up that you could use it and serve it as a roast, but it's a really good way to serve beef in a more cost-effective way. And people tend to really, really enjoy it. Um, one of the things that is really important when you're making some of these roasts is to know sort of your timing, right? So in terms of the high temperature method, what I've done here, and this is on 450 because this oven doesn't go up to 500. If I were doing this at home, I would first make sure that my oven is as clean as possible, okay? Because at that temperature, anything that's caked on your oven is going to burn off. And what I've done is I put it in the oven and you'll see this particular oven has a probe. But what I've also recognized is that I kind of like to have a backup. And so in our kitchens, and I have one of these at home, in our professional kitchens, we have these thermometers. They're called thermopens. And as you can see, as soon as I take the probe out, it, it turns on extremely act, um, accurate and effective, right? It's, what we, it's what's being used in professional kitchens. So I use this a lot to sort of get a read on what's happening temperature wise. You do not want to leave the meat into the oven, in the oven until you've reached the desired temperature. Because whenever you cook protein, you need to take it out of the oven and you need to let it rest. This particular recipe, the high temp recipe that I'm using for the tenderloin and the eye of the round, I usually leave the meat in the oven at 300, I'm sorry, at 500 for about 28 minutes. If your family skews towards the rare side, you may want to take it out at 25, 26, okay? And then what I do is as soon as I take it out, I have a piece of aluminum foil ready to go and I wrap it tightly. And what I mean by wrapping it tightly, I'm not wrapping the pan, I actually am wrapping the piece of meat itself in the aluminum foil and then I let it rest for about 20 minutes and then I slice my meat and it's ready to go. So in terms of like no fuss, like this is for me sort of the way to go. And what I do is I probably spend a little bit like in terms of the sides that I would serve, like I would probably serve like a potato gratin or a spinach gratin to add a little bit of richness with that beautiful roasted green vegetables. Like what I would, what, what I usually do is I take out the roast and I have a roasting pan of vegetables ready to go. And while the meat is resting, I pop the vegetables into the oven and let them roast. I lower the, the temperature on the oven to about 400. And then I let those um, vegetables cook while the meat is, um, is resting. That is often the most challenging part that people have with planning like a dinner party menu or a holiday party, a holiday menu is figuring out the timing. So in my head, I've calculated I need 25 minutes for it to cook. I have 20 minutes that it needs to rest. During that time, I can pop in my vegetables and have them ready to go. And I probably would also have... Um, you know, I would probably do a potato dish because they hold up very well. And I also would have a very flavorful green salad ready to go. The potatoes, the green salad are also things that I could have, you know, made well in advance. I would wait to the last minute to dress that salad and then I would lay it out all on the table. Um, coming back to what I like to do in terms of serving with the beef. I'm just grabbing the cutting table. Yep, they're right there. Mm -hmm. They're in there, bottom shelf. So there are a variety of sauces that people like to have with their beef. We are a very big fan of, in our house of something called chimichurri. And chimichurri is an Argentinian, it's an Argentinian recipe. Um, and what I like about it is it brings together, I tend to be more of a vinaigrette type person than a creamy, you know, you could obviously make a cream sauce or horseradish sauce, but I kind of like the lightness of the chimichurri. And I think um, the acidity in it is a nice contrast to the richness of the beef. So this is chimichurri that I've made earlier today. And so I'm just gonna walk you through sort of the way I like to make it because it has a little bit of a Puerto Rican influence given my family's background. So 
Chimichurri can be made with either parsley or cilantro. People who tell you that cilantro tastes like soap are not lying. There are some people that do have the gene that makes cilantro taste soapy. So thankfully, no one in our family has that gene because cilantro is a staple of Puerto Rican cooking. So when I make my chimichurri, I do use cilantro. If you are one of those people who is genetically predisposed to think that cilantro tastes like soap, then I would highly recommend using parsley. Um, they are interchangeable. The taste is slightly different, but still the sauce is fantastic. So I wanted to show you, I have my little packages here. I am using fresh parsley. I'm not using dried parsley. And what I did this morning was I basically, I washed the parsley, rolled it in paper pet towel to dry it. And what I do is I really do kind of try to take the part, I'm sorry, the cilantro off the stem and have a huge pile of the cilantro, right? Then I'm also using fresh oregano, which is not something that people tend to use a lot um, in American kitchens. We tend to use the dry product. You could also use the dry product, but also remember that if you're using a dry product, the flavor of the dry product is actually more concentrated because it's been dehydrated, all right? So basically, you know, I kind of come along the stem and I'm pulling off the oregano. Now, the other thing that you kind of need to play with is sort of understanding the acidity profile of, you know, what you like and what your guests like. I tend to go towards the tangy, towards the acidic. So usually, you know, what I had in the recipe is, you know, a half a cup to three quarter of a cup of olive oil with a quarter of a cup of red wine vinegar. That's kind of the baseline. I tend to up the vinegar quantity. So in here, I've chopped the cilantro, I've chopped the oregano. I also have some smashed garlic in there, some salt. Um, and I basically, this has been sitting, you know, I, I got up this morning, I made it, I made this around six in the morning. So ideally, if you can make this in the morning, that's definitely where you wanna go. But it, it just, it, it's, it basically tastes like a very herby cilantro vinaigrette. And it, it tastes fantastic on the beef. It also works really well on chicken and fish. This chimichurri sauce is actually a staple of our tailgates. Um, we tailgate all the time at Gillette when we're allowed when we're allowed to go and watch spectator sports. So what I usually do is I usually grill skirt steak and I make steak sandwiches. So I take a baguette and I put the chimichurri on the baguette and then I put um, the the churrasco or the strip steak. That's also being said, you can serve this right alongside your roast, um, but then you could also make steak sandwiches with it and it makes a really, really nice, um, nice snack. So I'm gonna just come over here and see kind of how we're doing. I think that my tenderloin is probably gonna be close to where I need it to be. See, I went in a little bit deeper. I'm gonna give that another, I'm gonna give that one another five minutes. Okay, that took a little longer. So the hard part about doing um, the roast is it does take a little bit longer than we might, um, that we often have for TV. So we're gonna let that go a few minutes and then I'm gonna take it out and we'll, we'll take a look at it. Does anybody have any questions about different cuts of beef, other things that I might serve, um, other ways that you might be able to prepare? Yes. Um, oh, can you, am I? Okay. We have a question about if your goal temperature is 130, what temperature do you alarm to remove the roast? Thank you. I'm sorry. I started talking about that and I didn't answer that. So a good rule of thumb is that you probably want to go five to 10 degree, five to 10 degrees below where you want to end up. Okay. So as I said to you, like if you're looking for that medium, that medium rare, like around 132 is probably a great place to be serving. 
So you don't want to take it out at 132 because if you rest it, then it's going to go up closer into the medium range. So I tend to set my temperature when I'm looking for a medium rare. Um, when I'm doing it, I'm using this method. Um, I probably would set it to take it out between like 125 and 128. Okay. Um, and the, the second question was also about that. I had a question about you had said that you had the butcher like cut off the the excess on the tenderloin. I was wondering if it's if it's because well, I mean you're a chef, so I was wondering if it's because it's easier that way or um, just for convenience. So I obviously like I know how to trim the tenderloin. The thing with the tenderloin is it's such an expensive piece of meat, and if you are not an experienced butcher, I wouldn't want to be wasting any part of it. So right. it's kind of like, yes, you may pay a little bit more, but then you're actually getting more of the roast. Because I think when people, it's something that obviously if you want to practice, you certainly can, but you really need to have a very, very sharp, excuse me, sharp knife so that you know that you're not cutting off. So even like, for example, here, let me show you. Like this is the eye of the round and I, you know, cut off that piece of meat. Like that little piece of meat is not a big deal. But if I have a tenderloin that's a foot like that long and I need cutting off that piece of meat all the way across, that's actually a lot. Mm -hmm. So you just want to make sure that it, like if you feel comfortable trimming it, please, by all means, do that. But it's it's I'm very big on trying to figure out the ways that you can make it a little bit more efficient and a little bit easier for yourself. I think quality butchering is a very good place to invest your time and resources. <laughs> um, how many days will the chimichurri sauce stay in the fridge? So I, um, we tend to have a jar of chimichurri um, in our in our refrigerator. So I kind of probably take it a little bit longer. Probably the rule of thumb is you probably don't want to go more than four or five days, but I feel comfortable because I know that it's kind of pickling and I kind of know the, that the oil and the vinegar are going to preserve it, but you do just want to keep an eye out it. Um, the other thing is, is that when you put it in the refrigerator, it is going to solidify a little bit. The oil is going to congeal. So you want to make sure that you take it out and bring it to room temperature before you serve it. Okay. Um, and, uh, what for people who haven't been here before what kind of oven are you using sure so i am using this is a wolf um this is a wolf um set top countertop oven um i actually have it on convent on roast today because um because it's at 450 so i wanted it to the, the roasting function will give it a little bit more a little bit more power um this oven also has the capacity to do convection um, I don't usually like to use convection when I'm cooking at such a high temperature. Uh, the rule of thumb with convection is that you should take it down 25 degrees and shorten your cooking time. I just took, this is the method that I've used to cook my, my beef, like that high bake temperature at 500. And I know that a lot of the ovens now, the newer ovens have all of these functions, but for this, um, convection is great for baking. Um, but when you're doing a roast like this, if you have the roast function, you certainly could use that. Um, but you just want to make sure that you understand what the capabilities are of your particular oven. The other thing too, is that it's also a really good idea to calibrate your oven. I've talked about this before. A great way to calibrate your oven is to buy a store, you know, um, a mix like a Duncan Hines cake mix and bake it according to the direction. So if you're going to do eight inch, eight inch rounds, you wanna make sure that it's like at the temperature that they say, and it's taking the exact amount of time that they say it does. If it's taking longer in your oven to cook it, that means that your um, oven is running cooler. If it's cooking faster, it means that your oven is running hotter. The other thing too, is that it's always a good idea to invest in a thermometer the oven, the thermometer that you could put inside of your oven. Some of the gauges that our ovens have on the outside are not as accurate as you would like them to be. So it's just a good idea if you're going to be doing a lot of baking or cooking or things like this to kind of get an idea of the way your oven runs. I like that idea because at the end of the day you have a cake as well. Exactly. <laughs> and who doesn't like eating cake? Exactly. Um, so we have a question from our last class, and I, th I think that actually really pertains to today as well, because we talked about the baking mats, not the Silpat, but another brand um, somebody bought. And when he uses them, 
he's they spray Pam on them before I put food on them. Afterwards, when I wash them, even though I hand wash them by themselves in the sink, when they dry, they feel greasy. Is there better? Is there a better way to clean them? Well, you don't. Um, you can toss products and like if you need, like for example, if you're using a soap mat and you're doing like vegetables and you're tossing them in olive oil, that's great. But you don't need to grease a soap pat uh, like the silicon mats. So depending, like, and I think that one of the challenges is depending on the quality of the, uh, of the, of the cooking spray that you're using, right? It's going to leave that residue. What you may want to try is making a combination of maybe baking soda, baking soda soap, like dish soap and water and soaking them in that for a little bit. Uh, Cause basically what you need to do is you need to break down that fat. Um, Dawn is particularly effective for breaking down grease. I will let you in on a little secret from the hotel trade. A lot of people use Dawn as a stain remover when they're doing laundry, because um, whatever it is that's in that Dawn is particularly effective at breaking down oils, especially like in things like makeup and stuff. So if you don't use Dawn, you may want to try the Dawn. You may want to try that combination of baking soda, um, baking soda and water, very hot water, baking soda and letting that mat soak. But if you're doing baking and it, the recipe calls, like if you're doing cooking and you need to, you don't need to grease the mat um, in addition, that's kind of the purpose of using the mat. Is, would soaking it in a little dishwater powder, dishwasher powder also work? Um, I think that you need to make sure that you're using a dishwasher powder that has like some of them now have like oxy in them, that it has an additional product that's kind of dedicated to breaking down that um that fat bond the other thing is is that i sometimes put my soap pat mats in my dishwasher i kind of roll them up a little bit and like you know make them into like a cylinder and stick them in between and i also run them through my dishwasher oh, okay um so you had mentioned that you clean the oven before you um put it on a high temperature what do you clean it with i have a self-cleaning oven so i i I basically run the self cleaner, the self cleaning function on my oven. This particular oven, what I try to do is when it's still a little bit warm, I like to wipe it down with a little bit like, you know, very, very mild dish and water and just wipe it down. This oven also has a part on the bottom that removes, it has a metal part on the bottom. So I also like to, to remove, remove that. Do you have a particular counter oven that you would recommend for young people? They're starting sure. out, young people who are starting out. So I have to say like, the, you know, this, um, I now have, I have two of these. Um, I have one here that I use, but I also, I have a Thermador, I have a Thermador dual fuel professional oven. If you've watched me cook and do any of my lessons at home, you've seen it, right? So that has six burners, a griddle, that are gas, then it has two additional, uh, two ovens on the bottom that are electric. This I use all the time now at home. I actually now have this at home and I use it all the time in lieu of firing up the big oven. The price point on this, depending on when you, like I bought this one at Williams Sonoma, it sometimes goes on sale. This is probably between five and $600. But actually, if you're young and getting started, and if you happen to be getting married, this is an incredible gift to put on your registry. This is incredible bang for your buck in terms of the technology. Wolf, in my opinion, is as good as it gets. Revel also makes a really good product, right? And this is one of the things where when I talk, I'm actually going to be doing a blog post about setting up your first kitchen. This is one place where I would splurge. Right. If you don't have a great oven and you have the space to have something like this, it is incredibly versatile. I toast. This is my toaster oven. I use it to proof dough. Um, I use it to cook just like I cook fish in it. I cook beef in it. I, I, I do just about anything that I would do um, in a large oven. Um, I do with it. Um, so I would look at this. As I said, I would look at the Breville. They have some smaller models. Um, you know, Interestingly enough, like Black & Decker, their toaster oven, it's a great product. I wouldn't expect it, to, expect it to last more than three or four years, but it does get the job done. 
You just have to be careful in terms of some of the things that you do because it's a much smaller space. This is a pretty generous size. I mean, I can roast a chicken in here, a, a pretty decent sized chicken in here. Um, I have a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. No, go so ahead, I'll I ask later. Something... Oh, did I take it too far? Maybe I did. Probably just how I like it. Yeah. So normally if you're seeing me do something that I would not normally do, I would not be opening and closing this oven this many times. So I also do a method of this. Like I also do the tenderloin this way on my grill, on my Weber grill, right? But the thing is, is when I do it, I do it on indirect heat. And if anyone is sort of hanging out with us and like spending time with us, I have to be very adamant because this is a little bit of a sexist comment, but I've noticed that when I'm grilling and there's men around, they open the grill. And I'm very particular about if I'm cooking, like I have an idea of what, what's happening with my temperature. So I don't want people opening up my grill because that's gonna disrupt my cooking, right? So I've done the tenderloin on the grill. And normally I would cover this up in aluminum foil, but I just, I want to, yeah, that's okay. Let's watch this a little bit. So that's at about 135. This is going to be okay. And look, you can see it's coming up. It's coming up. And I'm going to let it sit for five. I'm going to let it sit for a few more minutes and I'm going to cut it a little sooner than, than what I might want to. Um, one of the things that happens that people do invest in a thermometer. Do not be cutting that piece of meat to check to see if it's done. Because if you cut it, as you saw when I inserted the probe, what started happening? All of the juices started flowing out. So if you're cutting your steak on the grill or your roast to see if it's done, you're basically letting all of that good flavor come out. So by putting the thermometer in, yeah, this is gonna be great. It's like at 138. I kind of know, I kind of know where I am. The point that I was making, every time you open up the oven, the temperature is going to go down. So you kind of have to have a little bit of faith, put a, have a little bit of confidence. You know, if you want to make sure it's better to be underdone than overdone. So if you want to be on the same, like if you want to take it out a little earlier, if you have a probe in it and it's hitting 125, you can just take it out. I'm using the probe today, but I'm as, I've become so confident about this recipe that I take it out at 28 minutes is what I figured out works for me for like what my family likes. I wrap it in the foil, I cut it at 20 minutes and it's ready to go. But as you're beginning to learn and as you're practicing, I would, I would completely encourage you to invest in the best thermometer or probe that you can have so that you can watch and begin to develop that expertise. Does that make sense? Yes, that totally makes sense. Okay, okay so we're going to give it a whirl, but it, it'll be a teaching moment. I am going to cut that a little bit early because we're sort of at the end. Are there any more questions? Um, yeah. Does the time work for any size? Yes. This, so this is really interesting. It actually, it actually does. But the key is, um, and I apologize that I didn't mention this. You want to make sure that when you start, you want this meat to be at room temperature. So what I mean by that is if I'm going to start cooking dinner at five o'clock, you need to be taking that roast out at about two thirty, three o'clock. If you are making a big roast. And I know that some people are like, oh my God, like it can't be outside. It's totally fine. You are buying high quality meat. Obviously you don't want your temperature in the kitchen to be 90 degrees, but you really want to make sure that it is at room temperature. If I were to take this probe, all right, I'm gonna actually, we're gonna do a little experiment here. I think that the internal temperature of this roast is, oh, look at that. Can you see that? That's at 41 degrees. Yeah. This roast has already been out for an hour. Okay. So think about that. You're trying to get a solid mass. I want to check to see what the other ones are. You're trying to get, you know, a solid piece of matter to heat up. That one's at 42. Okay. And the tenderloin 
my kids are so excited because they knew that this was my class today. So they know what they're having. They know what they're having for remote high school lunch today. I feel like I want to come over to your house Anytime. to eat. <laughs> if it was safe. So obviously I inserted that probe into a raw piece of meat. I'm going to take my sanitizer. And I'm going to wipe it down, but I actually, and not pour it on the meat. I am actually going to go ahead and I'm going to give this a cut. All right. While you're doing that, can you talk about safe temperatures for eating? Um, well, in terms of the meat, what I would do is that you really do want to make sure, um, like anything, you know, there's some people that will eat it at 128. I tend to be over the 130 mark, right? But you have to remember that people do eat steak tartare. My, fit, my, my kids love carpaccio. The key thing is making sure that you're buying your meat. You know your butcher. You know the quality of the meat before you do that. Um, I wouldn't recommend eating, you know, when they talk about hamburgers, you really want to make sure that you know where your chopped, your ground meat is coming from. And that is something that you really do want to skew like medium rare or higher. There's some restaurants that won't even sell their hamburgers medium rare. I'm always a little bit suspect of that because then that means that you think that there's a, something questionable with your meat. So make sure that you understand the quality and like taking it over that 130 mark, you should be good to go. All right, let's see. Oh, I can tell it's rare. Look at that. And the beauty, the oh, yes. <laughs> Woohoo! And I'm probably cutting this a little bit sooner than I should, but like, I mean, this knife, I could probably use a butter knife to cut through this. Yes. Yeah. It's so mm. delicious looking. All right, let's look at the, let, and you're going to see, like, um, I probably should have drawn more attention. This, I can even feel it. This is not going to be as pink. I, um, let me show you that. See how there's more given that? If you close your fist, like this part of the fist is a really good place to sort of experiment with the way meat should feel. The tighter it is, the more done the meat um, is. So that's always a good way to experiment too. Oh, see, not as pink. And you can tell that it's a little bit tougher, but look, it's a beautiful roast, works really well, like works really well when you're trying to serve a crowd. Now, would you use those juices that have come out at, for a sauce? Um, so the reason there's more juice coming out is that I did this at five minutes as opposed to 10. If I waited a little right. bit longer, we probably wouldn't see as much of that coming out. I wouldn't, I, I don't, you know, you know, what you would use is, Christine, if you show it, you can use the pan juices. You know, if I wanted to deglaze that with a little bit of red wine and add some butter to it, like that would be lovely, okay. right? I could have, a little bit of butter ready. Um, I would use the red wine. I would deglaze it to pick up all the caramelization. And then I would probably throw a tablespoon of butter in, which, you know, the French refer to as monting a sauce. You're basically loading up that sauce. Um, but I'm going to serve it with my chimichurri. So I don't necessarily need the butter bee sauce, but you can see how juicy this is. Obviously I'm making a little bit of a mess here, but, um, and you probably, um, you can use a rimmed, a rimmed cutting board to be able to cut that, but you can see all the juice that's coming up. Can you say what kinds of meat is it? Yep. So this is the tenderloin. This is the tenderloin, right? So it's the more tender of the two. And see, look. Oh, this is perfect. So okay. Remember how red that was? Yep. Look at it now. It kept because cooking a little bit. I cut it so soon. I cut it so soon to show you and look what came out on the cutting board, right? So this is why we wait. So this you know, was not my intention, but this is why we rest our proteins. But and you can still eat that, right? This is tenderloin and this is the eye of the round. Okay. And <laughs> yes, you can have beef at 10.40 in the morning. <laughs> It's five o'clock somewhere. You got it. All right. <laughs> Can you um, tell me, I missed in the uh, sauce that you had said three to one. 
yes. um, the ingredients. Mm -hmm. And I missed which was the one tablespoon or. Um, if you didn't receive, um, Mina circulated the recipe. So it's the recipe for chimichurri. So it was three parts rosemary and then the other components are the one part. Thank you. No problem. So a few questions. Um, where can you buy the thermometer you were using? Um, you, they have it. That's commercial. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, you can buy it. You can, you can buy it at Williams Sonoma or you can buy it on Amazon. I think okay. at any price, um, they're not inexpensive. They range from about $70 to $110. Um, I was in the Williams Sonoma. I was in the Williams Sonoma Winfield. They did have them. And also, um, I was doing another cooking class earlier in the week, and some of the people that were in the class as we were teaching, were, as we were going, were looking on Amazon, and there were several products that were available there. Okay. If you use a thermometer to test the meat before you put it in the oven, what temperature would, are you looking for? And also, does this mean e more even cooking? Yes. So, okay. So I probably would want to be like, you know, I would probably want the meat to be like more in the 60 degree range, right? Um, that's probably what I would be looking for. Um, and yes, it does mean that there's going to be more even cooking. Because the issue is, is most, even though most recipes don't say it, most recipes from are based on the fact that the room, that the meat is at room temperature. So think about all of the energy physics, how much energy needs to be applied to raise that temperature each degree. So if you're starting at a much lower temperature than the test recipe, then the recipe is going to take longer. Okay. And I just want to confirm that the second roast is an eye of round. I have it right. is. Okay. Yep. So, yep. and um, for today's demonstration purposes, I actually, all of this meat did um, did come from Costco. Um, I know that all of these roasts are also available um, at Wilson's. They do have the eye of the round as well. Um, and so, for example, I was talking about lunch, like half joking, but I'm totally serious. You know, it's three meals a day right now if kids are home from school or home from college. So sometimes what I'll do is I will make the eye of the round in the morning and then I'll just slice it and I'll leave it for my kids and my husband to eat you know, throughout the day. Can you talk about um, the organic meats and um, do you do you use them in your restaurant or, or at home? I just want to like, sometimes I'll, I try to buy the organic, but uh, how bad is it if I don't? And so I think that we're really lucky to live in an area of the world that even if our meat isn't completely organic, it's actually really high quality meat. So we work with several purveyors. Um, you know, we buy from a variety of high grass fed beef, we buy organic. It also depends on the time of year here at the restaurant. I also have like a CSA, I think people have heard me talk about. I have different CSA meat shares. So I buy beef from River Rock Farm in Brimfield. It's delivered right to my house. So the thing that's really interesting is that sometimes you do have play and get to know the beef that you're working with because depending on the feed that they're the feed the meat does have a little bit of a different texture and it's just a matter of getting used to sort of figuring out um, the texture of them but we're really lucky there's a bunch of farms in the area that are available that sell meat in small quantity so for example my pig is from Codman Farm in Lincoln but they also are now raising cattle and lamb so I would totally encourage people to, to shop around and go and buy some different meats. You are going to find that it tastes different, right? So for example, American lamb tastes different than New Zealand lamb. And beef does taste different depending on where and how it was raised. So those are a few things that I would recommend. And as I said, like, you know, this may be an urban myth, but someone had said that like Julia Child bought meat at Costco. They do a pretty good job with, they do more than a good job on the person. So I recognize that not everyone can afford to buy all organic meat. It can be really expensive, but you want to make sure that you're selective about, you know, beef, it shouldn't be something that you're eating every day in your, in your diet. So you want to make sure that if you buy it, that you're making an investment in finding the best quality product that you have. Thank you. Um, did you use the same temperature for both cuts? I did. And they cooked at the 
one of them looks so much bigger than the other. So it's curious. It is. That they but you can be here, but look at the raw product. This is my tenderloin. That's my eye of the rat, different size. And the other thing too, is that one thing that I didn't get into. So tenderloin has a bit of a tail. You see that tail? What I could have done is I could have used this portion of the roast and tied, tied together to ensure evenness, right? If you have a little bit of that flap, see there's other bit of a flap here, you want to kind of tie, tighten it so you're getting an evenness. The tenderloin is just, it's not as thick as, it's not as wide around. Okay. So you are correct. It wasn't that there was shrink. It's just that I started with something smaller. Um, now, the other thing too, to take this to another level, is a lot of people I know have been experimenting. You know, this is a little bit of a more um, a more advanced technique. A lot of people have been seeing with sous vide cooking with using an immersion circulator. And so sometimes, if I'm short on time, I sometimes prepare tenderloin and immersion circulator. When I'm cooking in an, and so immersion circulator, what it is, is basically it's a hot water bath. So you insert, um, there's the immersion circulator basically heats the water. The water is all at the same time. And what it ensures, it's a very even way of cooking so that the entire protein is consistent temperature. So it's also a really good technique to have if you are working with an expensive product like the lamb or the tenderloin, because then I know that it's completely even temperature. And then I just do a little bit of a sear at the end and I'm good to go. But okay. we could all that. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think we're having a little, a little problem with your sound, but um, I think we can still hear what you're saying. I hope. Um, Julia bought most of her meat from Savonors. Oh, Savonors is a great butcher. Okay. Um, and George said he didn't understand how you tie the tail. Can you please sh uh, elaborate sure. or show us? Yep, let me see. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. Kitchen twine. <laughs> my, my cabinet of tricks. Okay, let me put that out of the way. So kitchen twine, you can buy it at any market. It's usually in the aisle where they have the, um, like in the supermarket, it's usually in the aisle where they have um, the cooking supplies. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a little knot. I'm gonna come this way. I'm gonna tie it again. Gonna come around. Gonna come under. And I'm just gonna keep going like that. And basically what I'm doing is I'm ensuring very similar to like when we did the chicken class, like when we trust a chicken, what I'm trying to do is just make, make sure that there's an even width and thickness throughout. Perfect. It's beautiful. Thanks. So it cooks evenly, basically. Exactly. That That's it. Our whole objective when we're baking or roasting protein is that we're trying to do whatever we can to maximize um, cooking evenly. That's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, I have one last question. Um, so um, we all, why is the tenderloin so expensive? Because we're always told that the the beef that has the most fat in it is the most flavorful. So why, I know tenderloin is very tender, but does it have enough flavor? So it's so funny because I think, so Christine, who's my general manager, who is filming, she prefers the tenderloin. Mm -hmm. I am a <laughs> ribeye girl all the way. <laughs> I just, I mean, I think that part of it is there's some people who don't like the fat, like the fattiness the ribeye like it just they can't even see the fat on the meat they don't like it i think that that's like like i think that's pure flavor so mm -hmm. the reason why it's so expensive is that you know, it's not a particularly large area it's high butchering and because it's not as much it's it's scarce but it also i mean it does taste beautiful it's very tender right it's very easy to get through that loin so it's just a matter of it's 
it's scarce because there's not as much of it. It requires more butchering because usually when you see it in its initial form, it has like the silver membrane. There's a lot of trimming that needs to be done to be able to get it to that. Whereas with the ribeye, it's a little bit, you know, oftentimes it's left on the bone. Um, it's a much bigger piece. I mean, this weighed, I think about eight pounds, whereas like a full in like rack with the ribs is like close to 22 pounds. So there, you know, it's all about kind of the economics, but again, it's all a matter of what you prefer. Christine's a filet girl. I'm the bone and ribeye girl. It's really helpful because I over, I've always wondered that. <laughs> yeah. And it's also like one of those things too. And please do not take offense if you're somebody who likes meat well done. Christine's raising her hand. Um, it's kind of a waste of money to cook a filet well done. Okay. Because you're basically taking you. all of the flavor out of it. So like, it's also important to understand that too, right? Like, why are you going to pay between $20 and $27 a pound for a piece of meat that you're basically going to cook everything out of? So also be aware of your audience and who you're cooking for um, and plan accordingly. Okay. What was that large piece of meat that you didn't cook? That was that a rib That's roast? That's a rib roast. That's Trisha's favorite. But if like, if I were doing, I, I would do it with the bones in. And when you order a rib roast, if you're ordering directly from a butcher, you, they, they can cut it. Sometimes they'll cut it off the bone and tie it back on the bone to make it a little bit easier for cutting. But I have knives that are sharp enough that I like them to just leave it intact because I don't want to lose any of that flavor. Yeah, that makes sense. Trisha, thank you so much oh, for this. Pleasure. I have learned so much. I'm usually, as usual, starving. Can you just take a minute to talk about what's happening at the inn and, um, and um, for, for the next few weeks? Sure. So as I said, the holidays have, have arrived at the inn. So some of the things that we're going to be doing, um, Santa actually is coming. He's coming every Sunday um, to do, um, for the next three Sundays, we're doing um, brunch with Santa. So people will get to visit with Santa in a physically distanced way, because I know for a lot of the kids, that's really important. Um, you can book that brunch online. We're also offering our champagne brunch on Saturdays. We're doing a frozen tea um, inspired by the Disney movie Frozen. Um, we only have a few spots left for that, and that's on the 19th. We're also offering a special Hanukkah menu from the 10th through the 18th. Um, it's available either here at the restaurant or to go, and it features things like latkes and matzo ball soup and, you know, beautiful brisket, um, sufganiyot, which are the Israeli jelly donuts, which are fantastic and are used to celebrate the holiday in Israel. We're also doing Christmas Eve um, in the restaurant, but also to go as well. So you can order any of the menus that we're doing for the holidays. You can also order them to go. Um, we're also doing the same thing for New Year. So if you have a small group of people that you wanna to get together with and don't wanna do any of the cooking, you can let us do the cooking. All of these options are available online. The other big thing that's happening um, Christine and I are heading outside to build our igloos. Um, we're really excited to announce the Whispering Angel Igloo Wonderland. So you might have seen on the news, um, they're basically, it's a geodisc dome. So we're going to be setting up four igloos outside so groups of six can eat outside, sort of inside outside, um, during the winter this year. We have a very special winter warmer menu that features things like French onion soup and duck cassoulet and a little bit of broccoli arancini with cheese fondue and some yummy sticky toffee pudding as dessert. So food, that, food that's meant to sort of warm up the soul. Oh, that's amazing. So we're a little busy. Um, so as you can see, what we're trying to do is give everybody any and all reasons to come and enjoy the restaurant or bring it home. The other thing is if you do have family that's coming to visit, our rooms are available. We've had families come to stay with us. Of course, if you're coming for a red state, we do require that you come with your COVID test. 
but we um, also um, could put you in touch. There's some online companies that are doing some COVID testing that make it super easy for people um, to be tested before they come. Of course, if your family is coming to stay with us, please let us know as we always like to leave special treats um, for the members, um, for anyone who lives in Lexington if their families are staying with us. So we hope that everyone has a fabulous Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, New Year's, end of COVID, and we'll look forward to seeing you in 2021. If that's and, <laughs> Wait, and there's more. Trisha is going to be back with us on December 15th at 7 p.m. to talk about three recipes, uh, three holiday recipes from around the world. So I hope you can join us for that. I will send out a link to it in our, our recap. And then Trisha is doing um, the start of the new year. She's going to be doing a winter soup session Friday, the first Friday, no, Friday, first. January 8th. Oh, we're doing Fridays. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that starts in January, but I'll send out those links as well. Trisha, thank you so much. This is awesome. And of course, as always, if you try any of these recipes and you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email is tpkeneally at inathastingspark.com. Perfect. Thank you so much.